Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we have out on the internet. Go to focuscompound.com to get investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. Follow me on Twitter at at Focused Compound. That's the best place to get access to everything that we put out into the investing universe. And of course, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, uh, we do have a hedge fund and we do have a separate managed accounts firm, uh, an RIA. You can reach out to me at andretfocusedcompounding.com uh, to start that conversation. For the first segment today in the, the news, we did something like this um, over the past you know year to year and a half where we talked about you know the current market and everything that was going on. Really, I want to try to sift through the noise as much as possible and bring up just actionable things that are relevant to value investors and people that you know, come at this from a fundamental stock picker's view. Now, of course, we are talking a lot about interest rates and inflation and stuff like that. Um, but I still think it's relevant just to everything that's going on um, in the market. So Nikki Leaks, Jeff, do you know who Nikki Leaks is? Uh, yes, we talked about him before. Yep. So he's the one that wrote Trillion Dollar Triage. He's also... Mm -hmm. Um, a Wall Street Journal reporter. People say that he is uh, in, uh, you know, Jay Powell's ear, or Jay Powell is in his ear. Whenever information comes out, you know, a few days before these meetings, the Fed meetings, or just information about the Fed in general, a lot of people have suspicions that uh, you know it's coming directly from Jay Powell to Nikki Leaks. Hence the name Nikki Leaks. Um, but he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal this week, Fed sets course for milder interest rate rise in February. And I thought it was interesting because it's been a couple of podcasts since we, we have spoken about inflation and interest rates. And it says the Federal Reserve officials are preparing to slow interest rate increases for the second straight meeting and debate how much higher to raise them after gaining more confidence inflation will ease further this year. Uh, in recent public statements and interviews, Fed officials have said slowing the pace of rate increases to a more traditional quarter percentage point would give them more time to assess the impact of their increases so far as they determine where to stop. And then on the right-hand side here, I have a screenshot which I thought was funny. Inflation has declined over the past three months due largely to falling fuel prices and prices of goods, such as used cars. There are signs soaring rents that other housing costs are set to cool, notably amid a sharp slowdown in demand, though that isn't expected to show up in official inflation measures until later this year. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the current state. Does this tell you that they aren't as fearful of over tightening, which is how he communicated his thoughts on inflation and interest rates in the past. We talk about financials on the podcast often, which are very sensitive to interest rates. So I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on what's going on currently in the interest rate, uh, in the bond market and inflation and the current state of the economy. Well, um, the sort of things that would be signs of a recession, you know, have showed up. So in all past cases, when you've had these kinds of things happen, these leading indicators, right? You've always had a recession. So normally the Fed would stop tightening uh, when they see that there's going to be a recession. Likewise, they usually have stopped tightening when they've inverted. Um, basically, it's not long bet between when they invert and when they stop tightening. Um, but that might not be the case this time. So those are kind of the two things, um, that they're having to deal with there. As far as inflation, you know, it depends on exactly how you measure it, right? So if you're just using, um, 
if you're not cutting it down to any sort of core thing or anything like that and you're using one month, then there's no inflation at all as of, you know, a month ago. But like you said, that's due to, you know, fuel and things like that. As an investor yourself, how much of, you know, like you wrote something one time that has always stood out to me. And I don't know when you actually wrote this or like uh, what the article was about, probably something with competition or maybe investing in a bubble. But you had said that you're not worried about overpaying for a company. You're not worried about investing in a bubble. The thing that you are worried about as an investor is basically misjudging the competition uh, when you invest in stocks. So obviously we talk a lot about interest rates and inflation in the economy on the podcast. And I'm just kind of curious to hear how much of your actual investing brain power or bandwidth goes to thinking about these sort of things. Well, all that I really care about is that I'm not using some unusually high number uh, for my earnings that I'm expecting, right? So it is an issue with those sorts of things because, you know, um, we talked about how to joinery before, right? So it's a UK stock tied to, um, you know, kitchen remodeling and things like that. So tied to real estate. And although its earnings came back pretty fast within a couple of years, um, you know, it took the better part of half a decade or something for it to get like sales back to where it was when the financial crisis happened, right? And that was with it opening a ton of different, a ton of new stores all the time and performing really well as a business. So you can easily overestimate things. And that is a problem um, when the stocks aren't all that cheap. If a stock is cheap versus its 10-year average earnings, things you know that are less cyclical, then you might be okay. But for things that are home builders, that are banks, that are tied to a lot of this kind of activity, um, you could easily end up paying a price that's too high. You know, um, Berkshire paid a price that was, I mean, not, it, it wasn't Berkshire directly, but um, uh, Munger paid a price that was way too high for a court um, furniture, right? Because that was something that looked like it was a secular thing, right? That it was gonna always grow and everything. Um, and it wasn't, it was driven by the dot-com, um, you know, renting furniture and, and opening up all these offices and everything. And, you know, th there just weren't all those many new businesses like that started up, you know, in any other time, except for that. So you can have periods where you, something looks normal and it's driven by the environment that you're in. And so that's hard in some cases, like if I mentioned, you know, container store, right? That's the kind of thing that's hard. It's somewhat connected, but it's not connected in exactly the same way that Greenbrick Partners is. So how are you careful to make sure that you don't overestimate if the earnings are a bit high? And, uh, that, you know, that's, that's something you have to be careful about. In that case, I would adjust it for things and kind of be pretty confident that it's not trading at a lot more than like 13 times earnings or something, right? So like if you use enterprise value instead of market cap and you use the earnings as of like maybe the last three years before COVID or something like that, you get a number that's in that neighborhood, right? So it's like, it's it's a price that's okay to pay, but it's not some deep value stock, although it looks like that. And it would be if it grew from here, but you just have to assume that the environment was kind of favorable for them. Mm -hmm. um, so like, are you actually like in that situation for container store, is it trying to understand how their revenue went from let's call pre-COVID 900 million to over a billion, which took their operating profit from 43 million uh, to more than double it to 125 million. And just understanding if that came from more volume or is it more like store volume or their footprint of their stores has, has you know gained some traction, meaning like there's more stores. So maybe that is more of a normalized number. How would you think about that? I mean, you can see in their case that it is volume because they have incredibly stable gross um, margins and they don't open a lot of new stores now anymore. Um, so you can tell that. But generally, I am very cautious with using very recent earnings. Now, historically, I would be comfortable using very recent earnings for something like a bank or like an ad agency or something like that. 
because if you're not in an unusual um, year or even a quarter, you can really annualize that because it's growing all the time and look at, you know, those sorts of earnings because it's not generally a very seasonal business and it's a business that just gets about a little bit bigger all the time that way. But there have been things that have distorted that certainly with banks. So that's, you know, um, has not been as reliable. And so I wouldn't do that. But there have been in the past banks where I would be pretty comfortable saying, look, you could just take the most recent quarter. And that's a pretty good guess if you annualize that, what their kind of normal earnings are now. So don't really worry about this idea of trailing or forward or whatever. Like as of this moment, their earnings are pretty much um, four times the the quarterly number. Mm -hmm. But that isn't true, you know, now, and it depends on the bank, but it, it, because it's distorted, right? So you can see that. And, and it's been distorted since COVID, certainly, because you saw, you know, unusually high growth rates in like deposits at some banks. You saw unusually high growth rates in loans. You've seen high growth in loans with flat or shrinking deposits at some banks now. So there's all sorts of things happening in addition to the the um, change in their, their spread, you know, mm -hmm. um, that takes time to catch up to them. So, you know, it's, you know, you know that it's coming the um, impact of rates, but it isn't all baked in yet. Um, the same way that we're talking about, like with inflation. So there's a lot that I do look at that way. It's, it's mostly to avoid overpaying because it's not that hard to figure out, you know, um, if you have confidence in what earnings normally are, then it's not that hard to know that you're not paying too much for a business. It's the businesses where you don't have a lot of confidence in earnings. You know, um, like we talked about Meta. Mm -hmm. So Meta went from growing incredibly fast to sh like shrinking. Um, Amazon had something similar. I mean, if you look at Amazon's U.S. retail business as best as they disclose it, it's shrinking in real terms, you know, recently. It's certainly losing market share and stuff, and it was growing much faster than anything else going into COVID and during COVID. And then suddenly it went from that to something that isn't growing as fast as, you know, um, value stocks are growing right now. So those things turned around on a dime. And, you know, obviously these are the kinds of companies that are firing people and stuff, but something, you know, happened there. And so it, the issue would be if you use the past earnings growth, right? Almost anything you put in could be wrong. Uh, you could be going from thinking that this is growing double digits every year to this is actually going to be a bit lower for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're going to pay, a, a, in Amazon's case, you know, a PE or, you know, whatever you want to use uh, for valuation metric, uh, you know, if, if that growth stalls or stops, that's going to severely hurt the stock. Well, the one worry that did happen is Cisco. So we've talked a lot about Microsoft in the 2000 to 2010, the stock went down, but the growth was good. Yeah. Um, Cisco had been a growth company and is not a growth company at all anymore. I mean, so it turned out that it was viewed as a growth stock. And then after the dot-com boom, it was not a growth stock anymore. Um, in fact, the actual growth of the business and stuff was pretty poor compared to things that are not considered growth at all. So that miscalculation is pretty serious. Because if you think, you know, as the multiples contracting everything, you think you're getting a good price. But as it turns out, you know, if you had bought a railroad right after um, the dot com crash, it would actually have grown, you know, earnings and stuff like that a, a lot faster than Cisco would, and people wouldn't have kind of baked that in. So that's the issue: is is the danger of using these kind of forward PE things and like price to earnings growth and all that. You have to be careful because you may, the things that have grown a lot sometimes are going to grow even more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very helpful and you know that and it's very useful to use that, that it's persistent. But sometimes that growth actually means that there's going to be really poor numbers in the near future. And investors are usually not very good at deciding what companies are going to grow at what rates like over the next five years or something. So it's not just that like they kind of overpay for growth versus value sometimes. It's also that they have a difficult time identifying growth as opposed to value. Um, Do you think investors almost always underestimate mean reversion as well or how powerful it can be? I don't know because there's some stocks where 
certainly, I mean, a lot of people suggest that there will be mean reversion because there'll be a lot of competition and and uh, that it, things have to go back the way that they are. I mean, we talked about banks. Everyone says that with banks, you know, price to book. And yet there's meaningful differences between banks that persistently earn higher returns on equity than others and stuff like that. So I do think, though, that by industry, it's often hard, right? So like industry profitability sometimes holds up better, um, like full cycle returns on invested capital and things like that. But knowing that you're going to continue to have growth in some things versus others can be difficult to know. Um in part because you sometimes have, for some of these companies, you have higher revenue growth than earnings growth, and then you have some decreases in, in earnings and um, cyclically, right? And so overall, it doesn't work out as well that way, whereas others might have even better earnings growth than revenue growth when they're growing pretty slowly. So a lot of times people just kind of do it based on, you know, things that they know will have volume growth over time, right? So they know there'll be a lot more e-commerce in the long run so that they assume that that means that the companies that are part of it will grow faster. Um, and they did for a really long time. So, I mean, I, I mean, they kind of underestimated that I I'd say generally for mm, a lot of years in the early part of the history of meta and, um, and alphabet, you know, under their former names in both cases. Uh, I think that people did expect the growth to come down faster than it did because the stocks were kind of cheap on that basis. They were never cheap on like a PE basis, but they were kind of cheap on that basis. So they may have underestimated that as they may have underestimated Starbucks at times. They may have underestimated Southwest airlines at times, Walmart at times in their growth phase where they always had high PEs, but the PEs turned out not to really be high enough. Mm -hmm. From your experience speaking with investors, and I'm always just curious to, um, hear this. So container store, right? Um, based on what you had just said, let's say you wanted to use more of a normalized operating profit. Perhaps they that number would be 42-ish million on like a normalized figure in operating profit if you're not going to really uh, account for what could be a COVID boom. On a $388 million enterprise value, that's, you know, whatever that is, um, you know, close to 10 times EBIT. And I'm curious, do you think most investors, if they feel like revenue is going to fall off a cliff and operating profit is going to fall off a cliff, they would want to wait for that to happen and for that news to come out into the market before they right. purchase the stock? I mean, if you look at a stock chart, it's down a good amount since 2021 from its highs. So we're back to basically sort of, you know, 2018 averages. Uh, you know, pre-COVID. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think people obviously want to see it turn around first. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people want to avoid things that they think will be down next year. Sure. I mean, but like I said, by my calculations, you know, it's not totally unreasonable to think that on average, it'll be about 13 times because like you just said, 10 times EBIT, you put taxes on that uh, tax rates that exist today, that's 13 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So the the issue there, of course, is that it's a retailer and that it's not going to convert it all into free cash flow, which is a major problem for them. So uh, it can end up being a lot higher. So I, I would, you know, I'd be comfortable with 13 times free cash flow yeah. in a lot of cases, but the, the retailers, usually the quality of earnings is lower, I'd say. Um, so I don't even think the stock is super cheap, but it, it isn't, it doesn't look expensive on like a basis of the, um, future as compared to lots of other things. Um, obviously it looks cheap compared to the very recent earnings, but they've, you know, they've said that, you know, things are gonna be worse. Mm -hmm. Um, so what about Ollie's bargain outlet, uh, the stock that we had spoken about on the podcast last year? You still follow the business? Mm -hmm. It's a retailer. Do mm -hmm. you have any general yeah, thoughts I mean, on the company? I mean, I've been to Ollie's, so I'm interested in the business model and stuff. The, my feeling here is the same as like Dutch Brothers. I think the stock is very expensive versus the um, what the business is. So it's not that I general that I don't uh, like the business or something, but I just think that's very expensive. Um, you know, you're talking about. Uh, EV to sales, price to sales, right? That's suggesting, you know, I'd rather see margins close to 20% than instead of close to 10% if I was going to buy something like that. Because again, remember the free cash flow on a retailer is going to be low. So um, 
a lot of times, I mean, we'll see, but a lot of times the return on invested capital isn't super high for a retailer. And so I think that the earnings quality is quite a bit lower. And so you need the the um, the price to be to reflect that, right? I, I'm less comfortable buying that than some other things that we talk about. Um, Would you rather own a restaurant or a retailer? It depends. It, it just it depends. So there's some restaurants I'd be totally comfortable buying. There's some retailers I might be comfortable buying. Um, might be. Mm-hmm. It, you know it. It also depends on the price. So. Um, Let's say price was the same. Oh, well, I, I would rather buy a restaurant that does like breakfast or something like that. Yeah. Like if you're talking about a fast food thing or something like that. Yeah. Um, a restaurant that's not opening new locations and that has a strong position it would be a good business. It would have a lot of free cash flow and would be a good price. And I'd be happy with that. Um, but there's retail things that are, you know, I, I'd be okay with too if they were the right price. Um, we've owned car dealers i've owned supermarkets um there you know especially retail is harder but it's not impossible but most of these grow to the point where you know eventually the returns on capital go down to like nothing i mean um you know walmart went from being you know having whatever it was 40 percent returns on capital or something in the beginning of their time as a public company to having ones that are just like everybody else you know um, and it, it didn't, doesn't really stop trying to grow now. It doesn't really grow now at all anymore, but you can just see that in terms of the, how that's, you know, that, that they didn't stay where they were. They kept trying to grow into other parts of the country and stuff. And I don't know that they've, you know, that as a business, they've done that great since, um, at this point versus like the market or something since, um, basically since Sam Walton, but you know, I mean, it's, you know, we looked at Disney and Disney's pretty close to the market. So I want to be, you know, um, Walmart's a very premium price right now. So that might help them look like they have good performance versus the market, but the underlying performance hasn't been that great. So that's kind of the thing that happens to all these retailers eventually. And usually happens to restaurants too. They won't, they, you know, they, they won't stop growing. Okay, so we can hop over to our listener emails. Um, uh, in this segment, we are going to poll four emails um, and uh, use them on the podcast. So you can email them to focuscompounding at gmail.com. Once a week, I'm going to poll the ones that I think are you know the most detailed, well thought out, of course, with trying to keep it, you know, uh, slide worthy. I mean, I can't have a 10,000 word email. Uh, but this was a good one that somebody had emailed to Jeff that he thought would be a great example uh, for the type of questions that we could go over on the podcast. So he has three questions for you, Jeff. And the first one is regarding the three-part test Todd Combs mentioned last year that he and Buffett have used, the 90% confidence of growth in five years, a 50% chance of a 7% Kager over five years, and less than 15 times multiple. Do you think Combs is referring only to per share growth or dollar slash volume amount of growth as well? Obviously per share growth must be met, but would be the growth test be satisfied if the volume slash dollar amount of earnings over five years were flat or falling so long as per share growth was there? So this is the question we get asked often especially when you talk about like free cash flow plus growth. Yeah. A lot of people say, what is growth? Are you talking about growth in EPS? Is it revenue? What is it? I think I have no idea because he didn't say, but I think that the important thing is just how reliable is the growth in the earnings per share. Obviously Buffett would happily buy a company that was like shrinking if he was totally confident that it would buy back its stock. That would be his favorite thing to do if he could be confident that. That's extremely rare, but he's done it before. I mean, he didn't expect IBM to grow. He bought it and then expected it to buy back things. I don't think he expects oil companies to be producing a lot more barrels of oil over time. So in terms of volume, I don't think there's a lot of expectations for growth in those things. Um, Volume growth and dollar growth is helpful at most companies. If you're a stock investor, it's helpful to have it because that when combined with 
decent returns on capital in the business does help stop the company from doing other things. So companies tend to freak out if they don't have um, growth in their core business and they start going into other things. And that often means buying them, paying a premium. And even if they're can extract some value from it, it probably goes to the seller, you know, that they're, they're buying from. So it's a big problem. And, you know, I, I found that to be the case that some amount of growth is helpful, but it could also be solved by having, you know, real buyback policies or dividend policies that are strong part of the philosophy of the business. Um, any of that would be fine, but usually that's, it's very, very rare that that would be enough to keep a company from not trying to keep growing. It's so interesting hearing though, like Buffett, like the way that he, his framework for investing in stocks, it really comes down to the confidence of everything and how sure he is of the assumptions that he's using. And it seems like the valuation is sort of like the easiest last part of his framework. It's basically, is it less than a 15 or is it less than 15 times next year's earnings? Yes, okay, check, done. I mean, the vast majority of his time is spent on just the business and how confident he is of the business and the durability, the brand, et cetera. And I feel like most people sort of flip that around where they focus way more time on the valuation and the multiple and less time on how confident they actually are in the business. Yeah. And one issue here is like the volume prediction. A lot of times people are using a prediction based on volume or something like that, but in a lot of businesses, it would be difficult to know if that's going to translate into earnings um, because volume may be possible to grow at different prices, but you would get different volume depending on, you know, how you price things. So you could, you know, it's pretty, some of these industries would be pretty responsive to, um, increased demand at lower prices and, and um, lower demand at higher prices. So you could grow the overall market in terms of the number of people involved with it, in the, um, but you might not be growing your earnings. So, uh, you know, Buffett's focus obviously is on things like, you know, he just thinks in his head all the time on things like return on capital and all of that. And so that hasn't changed since the time that he was investing the Ben Graham way to now. It's always been that same sort of idea. So shrinking is a pretty common way of how value stocks, uh, you know, especially the ones that he was buying, um, do provide their return, right? So a lot of times it isn't through having a lot of volume growth. It would be easier to know if it was volume growth and obviously pricing growth. So, I mean, increasing prices and then buying back your stock um, is probably the easiest way to figure out that you're going to grow, but you could calculate it on all sorts of other things. Um, you know, obviously if they're opening totally different stores and things like that, like we just talked about with some things, you can predict that because then they're new in, in those markets or they're going into new places. But once they're filling into things that already, um, they're already present in and stuff, then it would be hard to really figure out if the volume growth would affect other things. So I don't know the answer to it. Um, I think people may overestimate how predictable the volume growth is that it's not going to affect other parts of the business. So like, you know, if you can say, oh, the number of, um, you know, the number of smartphones is going to grow by 2% a year for however long or whatever. Um, uh, okay. I don't know how well that translates into, you know, knowing anything else about it because that's really based on things like price determining how fast it will grow. And um, it'd be a much bigger market if prices were much lower and it's a smaller market if prices are a lot higher and it could, the profitability could be a lot different. So um, I think that he probably doesn't use as much what you're thinking of there with the volume growth stuff. Um, that's, that's usually how people think talking to me about it is the, the growth in those numbers. Um, you know, I that, think that's about how it like growth in EPS. Out. I mean, just compounding. Buffett thinks always in terms of compounding. So is the business right. compounding, is the EPS compounding, is the um, owner earnings compounding? His share of those earnings is it compounding? Yeah. The easiest things to figure out with that would normally be inflation, like pricing, right? And then second on that, 
that's usually the one you'd have the most confidence in in a mature industry, which is what he's usually investing in. And then the second one would be like growth um, of the overall market that just reflects like population growth and things like that. So inflation plus population growth kind of stuff, um, because that doesn't assume market share gains or losses. Um, the really good businesses take share though over time. So um, those are the best. And those are kind of the Peter Lynch things of the ones that open one store after another and, you know, or one restaurant after another, like we were saying. And, uh, but those are by taking a lot of market share, but some of the others are too. I mean, he, he's invested in um, Geico, which has taken market share for decades. Uh, his next question, Andrew recently tweeted, focus compounding's preference for avoiding businesses that sometimes earn 15% or worse on net tangible equity. I also recall you in past podcasts slash writings discussing your strong preference for very stable operating margins. Stability is better than volatility, all else equal. But what about the idea of taking a lumpy 15% over a stable 10% as Buffett has said, and or some volatile businesses being attractive as Munger has noted of C's candy? Why the marriage to stability each year? Maybe you equate stability each year to predictability generally which Buffett always seems to demand, say over a five-year horizon, even if not every year. Yeah, I also think the mistakes that Buffett's made has been the ones where they were lumpy. So I think those have been the ones that he got wrong in a big way, Buffett or Munger. Um, so I think that the ones that are easier are the ones where it's pretty stable. Um, the reasons for the stability thing is that it's not just a number that you're seeing, it's giving you a, some insights into what's going on in the industry. And um, if you obviously having data like that market share isn't changing at all or something would be most helpful to know, right? Instead of knowing things like uh, the financial results that you see. But if you see a common relationship in which uh, operating margin, you know, gross margin, operating margin, whatever, tends to be very close to this number all the time for the company. And also that their relationship to other companies in the industry always shows a certain advantage to the same company, um, that is useful to know. So the industries where that's not happening often has changes in who the leader is. Um, like the highest return would sometimes come from a different company, which would be worrying. It has large changes in market share, which is worrying, large changes in volume. Um, and, you know, it's just reflecting lots of different things. So like to have a stable gross margin, generally that would mean that your not getting overloaded with inventory at some times and then having too little inventory at other times. Because if you did, then it would show up in your gross margin almost certainly. So, um, you know, it, it's just all those kinds of issues. I also think that cyclical industries in general are worse for all participants because they're less able, the companies, to figure out what's the correct policies to have long term and that cyclicality generally reflects miscalculations. I think that without miscalculations, there shouldn't be cyclical industries. And it's just something that happens. And um, it, it it does reflect that there's mistakes being made by the companies there as opposed to um, more predictable situations. Usually, you're going to have high cyclicality is like lower market power, your ability to influence the market and to set the price of your product and stuff is not as good, right? And that's why you have the cyclicality. On the other hand, I don't mind some things that I think don't reflect competitive stuff. Um, so uh, like, let's say all insurance companies, all car insurance companies have a bad year, they lose money, but you still have the same cost um, relationship, like in terms of rankings. Uh, rankings are more... They're, they're easier to see um, stability in, like they're easier to predict. You can have higher confidence in the rankings rather than the actual uh, numbers. So the relative position. So if a company is still a low cost company, then another company is a high cost company, then that doesn't bother me. Uh, it also doesn't bother me if they have things in a segment that isn't their core business or like I bought Nintendo when it lost money. Um, because it launched something that failed. So that doesn't bother me either. But if it, if you suddenly had massive deterioration in like an existing product or then that might bother me, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's the same thing, like a movie studio launching a movie and it flops and that ruins your year. It, that wouldn't bother me. That's, that's one data point. Um, but yeah, I, I think that he does say that. 
and it should be true in theory, right? Like in terms of how they report things, they don't they don't want to worry about what their earnings are each year. But yeah, I, I mean, the mistakes I think have been strongly in that category of mm -hmm. things that are more volatile. Yeah. I think if you could sum it up, it would just be that, you know, companies that have very little competition tend to have very little variability in their margins. So that's why Jeff really cares a lot about stability. Uh, companies that have strong competition, they tend to have a uh, pretty good amount of variability in their margins. And I think it's looking at the numbers uh, to really get a good feel for the business itself. So if gross margins are, you know, very stable, high, they don't move around a lot, very strong, that could tell you a lot or give you a hit about the market power of the business, maybe with their suppliers or with their customers. Um, if they are wobbly and all over the place, that should be a hint that there's something probably going on with pricing. If the operating margin is, you know, wobbly and all over the place, the variation in it is big. It's probably something that's more volume based. So I really just like it because I think it gives you a pretty good snapshot in real time about, you know, uh, the business. It gives you a tell to basically go and do more research on it. I mean, if you're looking at a company that, like I said, has very low cyclicality in their gross margins or operating margins, I think that tells you a lot about like the business quality itself and that it's really trying to take that tell or that hypothesis and trying to go, you know, figure out what's going on with the company. I mean, don't you think that's probably why you like to focus on these, uh, you know, businesses that are very stable in their margins It's because it tells you a lot about the business. It tells you a lot about the business. I wouldn't say it's all competition. People always, uh, when I talk about these things, I think focus a lot on the competition aspect of it. So let's take like Micron versus like a supermarket, right? There's probably more competitors in a local market in some cases, you know, like where I live, there's more, there's actually more participants in the market um, in the, uh, you know, within that town or whatever than there is in the market that Micron's competing in. Um, so there's more competition and the earnings for all of them are fairly low in terms of their, um, on leverage returns on capital. However, the volume is very predictable in terms of what people are going to want. And the product isn't going to be staying on the shelves very long either. So they can't build up a lot of inventory there and they can't be thrown off by surges in one way or the other. So it's a very easy business to run that way. And so once it's profitable, it's going to continue to be profitable because it's just operating on the same basis and the same relative positioning things between them are going to be an advantage or not. Uh, in some industries, th there could be so much change in the industry year to year that what is the best business might change really depending on the environment they're in, right? So like if you have higher operating costs in some things and then you have lower like variable costs than someone else, there might be years in which the having really low variable costs is a real big help. Um, you know, if you're more efficient on something in a year when the, the materials cost is really high or something because those things are moving around so much. Um, so like they're built for all sorts of different environments, but that's not going to need to be the case. What is a very successful supermarket one year to the next is going to continue to be. So in their position relative to each other, it's going to continue to be the same. You're, um, and that's what I'm worried about is change in general. And so it is a lot more than just the competition aspect of it. And a lot of it does have to do with the capital structure, um, what it actually is invested in. So, you know, you're going to have very fast cycles that are very, very wobbly in things where you have a lot in inventory and receivables and stuff like that. Um, and, and they'll be very short cycle. And it, it may be hard to know that you're continually like having some big operational advantage there, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I want something that's, uh, as Buffett says, a durable competitive advantage, right? And if things are changing a lot, then it might not be a durable advantage. Um so, and the, the ones that trick you sometimes on that are things that look predictable, are things like, say, um, the customer acquisition cost changes or something, right? So, like, it was working for a while, and then now it isn't, because it's 
it, there's, you know, different sides to the business and the business might still be succeeding on one side, but then it becomes difficult on another side, you know, and that's what I mean. So in some years, it may be that someone's better at getting customers in the first place, even though someone else is better at, um, at running the business once they have the customer and it can vary depending on all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I, I'd be cautious about that. It's, there's nothing wrong with buying these things. It's just that you have to buy them at the right prices, which is based on like, you know, the gram stuff whether that's price to book or the 10 year average, what's the actual average of the earnings or uh, the average level of price of sales and operating margins. You have to treat them as cyclical. And then his final question, old school value investors, Cram, Condil, demanded a low price to book. I go back and forth on when slash if to require it, even if earnings multiples, PE, even EBIT, et cetera, are sufficiently low. Do you always demand a low price to book? If not, when don't you? I don't because I've invested in businesses that don't have any book value. Um, I've mentioned things like over-the-counter markets, which would have like no book value, but so would other things that we've mentioned before, like um, anything in information stuff often doesn't, especially if they bought back stock. Um, so I don't think it's relevant from that perspective. Um, it basically breaks down to two things. Is it a franchise business or is it not? If it's a franchise business, it doesn't matter what the the price to book is because you know it doesn't matter what replacement cost is none of that stuff matters if it's not then the amount of capital in and stuff matters a lot like someone sent me an email asking about private businesses and what like would you use ebd ebitda for the matter thing and i think i gave a disappointing answer which was that you know for most businesses no i mean i would look at an asset basis i'm not going to buy some local service business or something on a basis of ebd ebitda i don't know what that means or anything I'd buy businesses sometimes on that basis if I think that they have a franchise, right? Um, something that sets them apart from others. So, and it's not a size thing. It's not like being a big public company versus small. Um, you know, if you were had the best location and a restaurant that had been there for 40 years and the best goodwill in town and stuff, then that could be a franchise. Whereas um, uh, much bigger businesses and stuff might not be. So, you know, in you want to base it on something that you think is stable over time. That's going to be the real driver of things. So for businesses that have clients that they keep over time and stuff, it's probably like sales or something like that. So, you know, that's why when I say advertising things or something, I'm going to talk about sales, right? Because if you imagine if you bought some sort of professional services thing, it comes with the client list, right? So the price to book doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what that is. In essence, though, you are buying it on some sort of basis in terms of if you want to say it's price per customer, it's the price per sales that you normally have in terms of billings, whatever it is, that's sort of what you're getting, right? And other things might change, but if your retention rate's really high and everything, then you're basically buying the existing customer base. So um, in a lot of businesses where that isn't the case though, a lot of manufacturing things, lots of other things like that, I would look at price to book. And I think that having a low price to tangible book is a really uh, important part of having confidence in some businesses also being lower than replacement costs is helpful um having it make sense that it would always be better to buy you than to open something else competing with you is helpful i mean the, the safest defense in most industries unfortunately is uh a, to operate in such a way that you're when you're operating efficiently you're earning pretty low returns on invested capital Right. So if you're if it's hard for you, you get to scale on everything and you're earning eight to twelve percent. That is actually pretty good that you're going to keep earning eight to twelve percent because you are set up in a way that's better than someone starting out where they'll have to earn lower for a while. And um, they would and then the, their added supply in the industry would depress returns for both of you. And that's going to help you maintain that level. The problem which is why I like the magic formula is not my favorite kind of thing, right? Is the magic formula, and actually I don't really like the just pure price to book thing. I don't like the magic formula. Don't like the pure price to book thing because it's comparing things where price to book makes sense and ones where they're financially distressed and stuff. The magic formula, the problem is it's a great idea of look for companies with high returns on invested capital and long runways. But a lot of times people say, oh, this thing must have a moat because it has a high return on invested capital. That is not true at all. There are things that have moats that have fairly low returns on invested capital, and there are things that um, that have high returns on invested capital for now and are going to be very low in the future. 
it takes time to compete with things. And what you're seeing is really just the product economics a lot of times. So, you know, we don't know what it'll look like over a long period of time. If you have high returns on invested capital over a very long period of time, that could suggest a moat. But that's the one that always worries me the most because that's not how Buffett thinks about it. It's not how I think about it. You don't look at the past results and say, oh, well, they must have a moat because you have these returns. These returns actually make you more vulnerable, right? If someone looks at over-the-counter markets, they would say, well, I should set up something that's like that because look, the economics are good. If they then look at a village supermarket, a car dealer, whatever, they say, oh, it looks like a lot of work to not get an amazing return. So I'm not going to do that. So there, there's in, you need a moat in something like this. And the things that are going to collapse the most are businesses that have very high returns on capital. And then something comes in and, and then um, brings those returns down because, you know, big gross profit margins and stuff are obviously basically large gross profit margins and low needs for capital are going to attract people. So um, businesses that have very low gross profits and very high capital needs are not going to attract competition. So, but you know, we own a bunch of stocks that do have a price to book less than one. And it is a factor in it in that I think that it helps determine what I expect their future earnings to be, that I have higher confidence in it because I don't think other people can do it for a lot less than they have it in there for. Um, and at some point they also can move into other businesses or liquidate or whatever. Um, because if you're generating a bunch of free cash flow and you're bought at a low price to book, you know, um, Capital gets reallocated. So uh, more of our investments are things that might surprise you that way. I don't necessarily expect them to stay the same. That's what a lot of Buffett's investments were in those kind of cheaper things. Like they change what they're in over time. And having a buying a lot of capital, a lot of tangible capital, especially a lot of tangible like current assets, like, you know, inventory is okay, but receivables and cash is really good. Um, land is fine too. Uh, a lot of that kind of stuff compared with some nice free cash flow too, means that a lot of capital can be freed up from the business and put into other things and stuff if it doesn't earn a good return. So, um, whereas, you know, businesses like over-the-counter markets, meta, anything like that, is a one-thing bet. There isn't capital in it. It can't be moved to something else. It's all, does this platform make a lot of money or not? And if it, if competition comes in and disrupts that, it's going to go to not be worth much of anything. When you talk about those businesses that are going to reallocate that capital, how do you get comfortable with that? I mean, are you are those the businesses that you're referring to as like franchises and maybe you, you like the CEO, the people that will be allocating that capital? I mean, if you're buying something that's less than a book, are you putting that in the same franchise class or is that more so buying something on like the assets or you know less than tangible book? Right. It's buying on the assets. So it's the assets plus the free cash flow that's going to be generated. So generally, here's the thing. If the returns are really low, that makes the hurdle for getting the same or better results in the future really low. And then if the industry is one that doesn't destroy a lot of you, that you don't have a lot of losses in, then it doesn't really bother me. So what I'm scared of is investing in a business that is in an industry where it could destroy a lot of value. But as long as I'm in an industry that I think that that won't happen, then I'm not so worried. So when we talk about like NACO or something, right? I would worry there about, well, what if they buy too much um, mineral rights and things like that in some sort of boom, right? If a boom goes on for too long, it could be bad. But for the most part, if they're buying, if you know, that's where a lot of the capital is going into, it's not the only place it's going, but let's say that is some of where it's going, then uh, I, I don't mind that they buy a bunch of oil and natural gas and, and things like that um, with the cash that they generate. doesn't bother me. doesn't particularly bother me for two buys dealerships using cash or debt. Um, they get good enough returns um, and they have, you know, low price to book and stuff. I mean, these aren't adjusted for tangible book and everything here, but even if you just look at the median margins and everything, these things are close to about, as reported, they're close to about a 10% return on equity and they trade for about two thirds of book value. So, I mean, Virtu generates less than free cash flow. So I, I think that you know, at its best, it was generating high single digits in terms of actual cash, which is how I would measure it. Um, but it's pretty cheap that way. And so buying a, 
essentially something that's similar to a bond that's yielding eight, nine, ten percent, and you're buying at uh, two thirds of its its um, face value there. Um, so you're getting a much nicer yield and everything. And then you could get a lot of capital appreciation if it ever gets up to like one times book or something. So, I mean, the thing I always remind people with is like if their returns stick to about this level and they reinvest everything and they're high single digits and stuff and the um, book value never goes up, right? It never closes the gap. Your returns will be this, about the same as the S&P. Like I think people don't necessarily realize that. Yeah, there's, um, I was looking at some life insurance company. It's a control company. So there's, it's not one that we're likely to buy or anything. But what I thought was interesting is reading all these descriptions of people complaining, you know, well, I, you know, this never, the gap never closes and, you know, this is terrible. And I'm stuck in this thing and stuff. But, you know, with it trading at a discount to book that's like the same for like 25, 30 years, it's not, uh, it, it was not um, behind the market in terms of the total return that it was getting. So, and there's other ones like that. There's some closed end funds that have the same thing where the gaps never closed, but their returns are about the same. So I'm not excited by like 0.2 times book and it loses money sometimes and stuff, but you'll notice historically Virtu and NACO, now this could definitely change at some point with something like NACO and Virtu will have, be interesting with never had prices of cars come down as much as they're going to. But historically, obviously, these businesses never lost money, right? And except for very heavy, lumpy capital um, expenditures with NACO, they, they generate free cash flow, right? So the actual number of years in which they were generating unacceptably low returns on equity wasn't a lot. Like a year in which they generate about 5 to 6% cash on their tangible book was a bad year for them. Uh, you know, it happened sometimes, but that was about it. So if you're paying two thirds a book, then you're getting close to 10% in terms of the amount that you're getting on that, you know? So if it closes, that's good. But I mean, that's what the return is. And I would have a lot more confidence in that than a lot of other businesses. That might be like a barbell type thing in that I would like businesses that are um, have fairly low returns uh, that are that and low price to book. And ones where I don't care what the price to book is, but they have a franchise. What I'm scared of is everything in the middle, right? So like, you know, I'm interested in the 10% or less, it's a lot less now, of businesses that maybe are a real attractive on an asset basis and are consistently generating earnings. And I'm real excited about the companies that are true franchises that I can have a lot of confidence in. What I'm most worried about is, you know, at least four out of five of all listed companies are neither of those things. They're not cheap on an asset basis at all to have confidence in them. And they're not any sort of franchise really. So they'll have good years and bad years. They'll be cyclical and, you know, um, you could easily overpay as a mistake, you know? So Graham's talked about that, that basically the danger is by paying a high multiple for a not good business at the top of a cycle. And a lot of people will do that. And that's the thing that you've really got to avoid. So that's the one that, you know, worries me the most is, you know, you see something, you say, oh, this is 17 times earnings. That isn't too bad or whatever, but that's their peak earnings. And then they have a couple of years that aren't as good. The industry, it doesn't work out as well. They turn out not really to grow that much and stuff. Multiple that's smack. really tough. That's Yeah, that's really tough compared to the companies that we're talking about now, where a lot of things can go not that well, and the multiple won't actually compress in the long run. Is yeah. a lot of that because it's already sort of baked in? That's why it's trading at, you know, a single digit PE? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. It's it's also interesting. I mean, I think sometimes predictability and quality in certain ways, quality is this very complicated concept, is underpriced sometimes. And like upside is more, people are more interested in that. So things that have very limited upside can sometimes be attractive. Um, that is, they, they, it's clear that they're not going to grow very fast or be very attractive to people. Um, so that can be part of it. I think, um, I mean, let me put it this way. It's not just that I think that those companies that trade at, you know, two thirds or whatever of tangible book are like cheaper. I think they're a lot better than most companies that trade at 1.3 times tangible book. I mean, I can look at lists of companies that trade at that and they're usually highly mediocre, mm -hmm. you know? Um, obviously those two businesses are also in industries people don't like, right? So they're in industries that are headed in a decline because everything's going to be, um, electric cars and solar and wind and things like that. So that's obviously a concern, but 
Which situation do you, Jeff Gannon, feel more comfortable investing in? A situation like NACO and Vertu or a situation like OTCM? A situation like OTCM. Okay. Now, why is that? But, well... Because it seems like OTCM just throws up good decision after good decision. When we, you know, read their their quarterly reports, it's almost like you expect success. And a lot of that's baked into the current price, right? That's why trading at more of a premium multiple. Um, even though on Correct. a free cash flow basis, it's not, I don't think, so crazy. But, you know, how do you sort of think about that? Right. And I um, like the management at OTCM. I would say, though, I don't know that they're making better choices than Virtu or NACO. I think they have a much better hand, which they developed over time early on. And the key things that they did were earlier on. That's what I mean by a franchise. So when I say a franchise thing, what I mean is they got to the point that they needed to where there was the risk built into it, you know? That would worry me a lot. The early days of um, this management team there and stuff would would be hard. Um, the early days of some other things we've talked about are the same way. But once they're in a position where things are going to be a lot easier over time, the decisions are going to be facing are a lot easier. Um, the, the reason for the difference between them, why I would like OTC better even at higher prices, uh, you know, I'd have more confidence in it, is that these are all passive investments, right? Mm -hmm. And so the good thing about OTCM is it generates it in free cash flow and it has a narrow definition of what it thinks it does. If that changed and it had some wildly different idea of what it did, um, then we'd be in for a problem. Um, and that's happened, as you know. I, I've bought into companies and then gone, oh, I'm okay with the business, but now the, the the corporation, the direction it's going and stuff is now a problem. And you can't kind of carve that out and have them just stay in the business that they're in. Um, and all three of these, you know, are actually not that bad at all in terms of like uh, di diversifying and stuff like that, right? So given the positions they're in, I think they're all actually pretty disciplined. Um, I know it doesn't seem that way, like say NAC or something, they're doing all sorts of different things, but you most companies, if they were in a situation where they have mines that are going to close over time that are coal things and stuff, they could do some really weird stuff um, really fast instead of kind of trying to find things that are more adjacent to what they're already doing um, and using the and reallocating the cash that way. So, yeah, but I mean, I think OTC markets is, you know, it's got a franchise there that way. I think that markets are, you know, um, it tends to be the kind of thing that is really really good that way you know there when we talk about sort of um network effects and those things i mean i don't think in terms of network effects but i think in terms of like liquidity stuff there's a sufficient level of that there and then it generates a lot of information which they then can use and so it has a, a there's a thing to the business that isn't all that different than a lot of other really attractive um, businesses yeah but some people are scared of that, you know, there are bigger companies that could go after them. And obviously there could be changes in regulations, you know, with sufficient lobbying by some other companies, if they really wanted to kill them and stuff, they could probably do some real harm to them through political pressure um, to get things rewritten. I think that's their best shot at, you know, at shaking things up. Earlier in the podcast, you'd spoken about investing in companies where competitors would just rather purchase uh, your business instead of, you know, going to compete. I mean, do you think OTCM is in that bucket just because of, you know, their own regulatory framework and how far along they are with that process. So you got to the secret of how I really think about things, right? When ah. people ask for all these different valuations and stuff. <laughs> the reason why I like both the cheap asset things that I do like and something like OTC markets is not the numbers. It's not thinking about it as a stock. The truth is I would buy all of these things myself if I had like a holding company or something, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at it in the industry, that's always what I'm thinking. Would I buy the whole company? Yes. Of course I would rather buy OTC markets than try to set up a competitor. You know, I mean, there was attempts to set up a competitor by people who had a lot more money and a lot more everything and it didn't work out. Most attempts in most countries haven't been very successful. Um, so as is the case for anything else, I mean, what, what number search engine was Google? I mean, I could probably name 10 of them. Mm -hmm. So there must have been a lot before there. Um, and uh, Facebook was not the first thing that caught on in what it did. You know, So if there's something that's a success, 
once it gets to that certain stage, right, then you would definitely want to buy it, right? You would definitely want to buy this now instead of in the 1990s or something, right? Um, so, but you're gonna have to pay a high price for it, right? And I do feel also with everything that NACO has and with everything that um, that Virtu has, uh, a similar thing that you would rather buy them than to build than to replace what they have. Now, in some cases, you'd say, "Well, I don't want to replace exactly what they have. I would do it differently." And that's fair. So some of the things assets are a little misplaced or whatever um, for the modern world. But that's what's attractive to me about both of them, uh, both of those kinds of situations. So that's the thing that I want is that you know it's something that I would that I would want to buy the whole company and that people in the industry would want to buy the whole company mm. rather than, than adding capacity. Yeah. I'm very worried about something where people want to organically enter the industry and compete with them. Obviously. I think out of the three stocks we're talking about, OTCM has the, I guess you could say the, the best chance of one day waking up and seeing a PR that they're getting bought out by private equity or a bigger player for just a huge premium to the market cap just because of what they do. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I assume that at some point, Virtu will be combined with something or sold to it or something because that's what happens always in that industry. But I think that you don't have giant premiums over tangible, um, the tangible value of those things normally. It's, you know, I think there's a general idea of what the premium would be over that. So there we go. We got the title for a video and the title for the podcast, Jeff Gannon's True Secret to Investing. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go into the next question. Berkshire currently owns 10% of Ally Financial, their typical limit to prevent regulatory and potentially tax consequences. If we ran into a financial crisis with order of magnitude similar to the GFC and, and Ally was in the need of a bailout, would you anticipate Buffett would do preferred convertibles to get them out of the hole? Question mark. If so, do you see any limitations to him doing so? Question mark. So the Buffett uh, put is what we're talking about. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think probably Ally's biggest issue, I mean, the, you could check on QuickFS. They, I know that they've changed the company over time, but I would think the issue for Ally is more along the lines of um, that it doesn't have a natural funding base. Now, it's developed one over time, but Ally is GMAC, so it's going to tell us that it was founded like 100 years ago or something because it traces its roots back to that. But it was the um, finance business. Yeah. 1919? What does it say? Yep, it was 1919. Yeah. 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 So it was founded to um, to sell GM cars, right? So it was part of what they did. And uh, so it had no good deposit base or anything, no good funding base. And so you're going to see loan, if it sh treats it as a bank, it's going to say loans to deposits are off the charts and stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> over right? the past, I mean, and it's calmed down a little bit over the past two years, but yeah, off the charts. Right. And you can see in like 2012 or whatever, the net interest margin is, what is that, two and a half percent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really bad when you consider what kind of loans they're making. It means that they're Presumably their costs were quite high um, than a borrowing. But over time, it could go down. And that's obviously what they're trying to do. The big thing they're doing is buying back the stock, right? Um, so I don't know about their, like, obviously don't know about the business in terms of how careful they are about the lost things and stuff like that. Um, I actually had a personal contact with Ally, weirdly, uh, in a situation in which they, um, did not know they knew, but they've been notified, but they, they didn't spread the information around the organization, uh, that a car had been destroyed. That was their collateral. Right. And so it took them about a year and a half to follow up on this. So it's not like CarMart, right? CarMart is going to contact you in a couple of days. Um, because there was still some payments being made on initially, um, you know, they didn't know that there was insurance things involved, a uh, uh, junkyard involved in, in holding it there and everything and stuff. And so their, their lien wasn't going to be any good. And so they just like looked so the other way. They, it's a big organization <laughs> and sure. they, that's not what the, that's not what this business is. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, but it, it was only noted. I, it only was interesting to me in that it was literally like 18 months later. So something happened where they look through things and they're like, oh, look at this. And they sent out a bunch of uh, letters. So I, I only mention that because this is different than some other things that we talk about of like um, that's real subprime type stuff, right? Because they're very careful about the whole collection of things and stuff. This 
from that part of it, it doesn't strike me as a very collections based business at all. So, um, so, you know, I don't know what that will mean in terms of the, uh, the loan losses and stuff. We can see what they reserve for it, but we don't know a lot more other than that. Um, my concern originally with the company, like when people were interested in this a long time ago is the, is the funding base. So I think that that's what they've probably changed over time. I'm assuming. So, um, the thing, can we go to the income statement maybe? Cause I think what stood out to me is the aggressiveness of buybacks. If I'm right about that, can we do like annual or let's see, what do we have? So shares are standing in 2012, 413 million. Um, and in 2021, it's 364 or 365 million. Okay. Uh, and then can we can see quarterly. It did go up to 483. It looks like, and then it started to go down. Yeah. We could go quarterly. Uh, they were at 324 million. Right. So that's the part that interests me. So the company seems to have changed a lot from, um, when I looked at it, like we're talking 10 years ago or something, because for one thing, right, shares were going up and now shares are coming down. Um, and really aggressively, if you look at the last few quarters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's hard to tell without reading the actual, um, you know, the, the 10K and 10Q and everything to have a good idea. But we can look at annual and look at like the overview and see. Um, Anything that sticks out? Yeah, I mean, um, so if we look annually, right, and are comparing it to like banks in general, and that's not exactly what this is, um, the overall leverage that we're seeing here is not low, right? So a lot of times when you have this kind of high cost funding, and relatively wide net interest margins compared to some other banks, believe it or not. I mean, the there was this 3.8% over the last 10 years. That's actually better than some banks we've seen. Um, you might actually have a little bit lower um, uh, leverage on the balance sheet in terms of total assets over uh, equity. It might be, you know, 20%, 25% or something lower. And it kind of was... 10 years ago lower, right? It's kind of gone up over time. And I don't know the whole situation there, but like the assets to equity or earning assets to equity as quick FS calculated here is kind of at the point that you would want it to be for even a much safer bank. Uh, you know, it's not that you couldn't push it that far, but like um, to let's compare to bank OZK or whatever it's called now. Um, so I can give you an example of what I mean. Right, so that has a wider net interest margin, right? And it has, um, the assets to equity, about the assets to equity it. are, right, are low because of, you know, that's not unusual that it's low that way, right? Um, and so it, you see that a little bit more on things like that. Um, yeah, so I just, but, you know, but their net interest margin isn't as big and everything. And I don't know the business as well. So I don't know, but it, it it's a little bit higher than I expected. So I don't know if that's a quick FS thing or what, but I would have expected it to be about 20% lower, about what it was 10 years ago. Um, so, which is interesting because like I, the reason why I expected that is because they're buying back stock. So I wouldn't have expected them to keep buying back to that level. You know, I would have expected them to slow. Um, so... I don't know, you know, like, uh, it, does it have particular problems for Buffett? Yeah. Yeah, it would get messy for Berkshire to bail out banks at this point now, or financial companies at this point, because Berkshire's a very large shareholder in American Express and in Bank of America. Um, so. So you would say, yeah, there's some limitations. Yeah, I mean, they mentioned the prevent regulatory and potentially tax consequences. I'm not really sure what Berkshire's reasoning behind that is they've mentioned it before that there's some you know there's some things they don't want to go over and there are some rules in place but for a publicly traded company on a public you know listed on a major exchange and everything the consequences as they currently exist are not very big like it wouldn't I, i'm not sure why berkshire doesn't buy more that way there's certainly market uh disadvantages to it in that you are reporting all the time 
that you're changing your position and people are paying attention to Berkshire and it's in the 13 F and everything. And so that, I think that kind of thing is more of a risk. You know, I don't think they'd be worried about like, um, that they want to turn around and sell it within six months or something of, of buying it or anything like that. I just don't think that's likely. I mean, if you're going to buy 10 or 20% of a company to think about doing that, then it wouldn't be something that you're doing as a short-term thing. Yeah. It makes sense that if you're doing merger arbitrage or something, they'd have serious things. I don't, I never thought they'd go over 10% of like Activision, no matter what, if they're doing a merger arbitrage thing, but yeah, this kind of stuff, I don't know. Got it. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, let's see. Somebody has said that they really liked when we did, I believe five stocks with over a market cap okay. of 10 billion. He said it was episode 247, published August 30th, 2020, 20 minutes in total. Uh, it would be interesting to hear his take on this situation slash question now, especially if you don't remember him of his picks back then. He said you picked Progressive, Carnival, Booking, Bank of America, and Luxottica. And it sounds like he would be interested if you could uh, revisit it, you know, two and a half years later. And uh, he said regards from Finland. So I went into Yahoo Finance and I put all of these stocks okay. in there in the performance <laughs> and compared them to the S&P 500. And interestingly, mm -hmm. all but one, which I'm sure you could guess the company, people listening, Carnival, uh, all performed the S&P 500, Jeff. So I would not have expected that yeah. because not everything's been good at those companies, but as there hasn't been as much multiple compression or whatever, I guess people are pretty positive on it because they've been mixed bags, but you know, I guess the S and P has been mixed too. Yeah. So there you go. S P 500, about 16%, uh, booking 22%, bank of America, 27 to 28%, uh, progressive, uh, let's see, Luxottica was the best performer at 57% and the carnival since then is down about 44%. So any thoughts on those companies in general? Just thought I would bring it up uh, to answer his question, see if you have any thoughts towards them. Sure. So it has changed on some of them. The big ones are Carnival. Uh, I mean, the price has changed, so that's a thing. But on Carnival, uh, it's completely changed mm -hmm. in terms of how much debt all of them took on and how long it took to get things going again. Um, I did not expect that to take as long as it did with with um covid and how badly it affected the um cruise lines so that's completely different um bank of america better right so it's mm -hmm. you know it, it's more attractive now than it was then probably so and then the other ones um Booking, progressive Luxottica. people ask right. about progressive a good amount i would say okay we can look at progressive so progressive you know rates are going up a ton in auto insurance they're going to be um, because, uh, the actual, so there's certain things you can look at to like get an idea of the, probably what the like immediate it, without it lagging and stuff effect was during the last year or so, like the year where we had a lot of inflation. Right. So uh, it's probably for some things, for things that were parts and labor stuff was up 20%, you know, like, like if they really expected things to continue this way and they didn't think that they could spread it out over a few years, your premium increases, they would need to increase your premiums by 20%. You can see that with Front Door too, which is not a company that does um, car insurance, but it does, uh, you know, warranty for repair in your home, you know, for like, you know, your dishwasher or whatever, things like that. And that business uh, definitely would have needed to raise rates by like 20%. So, yeah. Um Progressive has become a pretty popular stock, I would say, compared to when I first talked about it. Definitely. Like, yeah, I feel like the multiples have gotten pretty high on it uh, and it's gotten consistently high. Um, like the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're interested in the business, you could get Jeff's singular diligence report on it as well for free at Focus Compounding. Yeah, what... Can you give me a longer-term chart on Progressive, though? Because I'm trying to guess... Yeah, where that is in terms of it is currently just, trading $135 per share. Uh, I got right. the all chart up. Do you want like a five year or is this good? Well, so it was probably 2015 or something. When do you, do you know when the report was done? Uh, I don't, but if it was 2015, yeah. 27 bucks a share. 
So I'll yeah. put that mile. So I, I I really don't know when it was done, and you know we would have been working on it before we released and everything, and it may have been that we actually did it in that part where it was already rising a bunch, but it just was probably a lot cheaper. Um, so yeah, I mean it, I do remember it was before the Fed raised rates back then. So it, it, yeah, um, that last cycle. So um, yeah, I mean it's a pretty popular stock now, you know. But I, I do like it a lot. I like it as a company a lot. Um, and in fact, I mean, probably if I had a choice between Geico and Progressive, I would have bought Progressive. Though I, I like them both. So uh, I think Progressive is better. Yeah, I think there's some things people don't that I talk about Berkshire. So I think they understand it now, but I think they don't appreciate the extent to which Geico has an advantage in terms of their customer base, the policyholders, and that that's reflected to some extent in the numbers that you're seeing. And Progressive has a disadvantage in that way. I don't think people have appreciated when I talked to them about it, how much better Progressive was at underwriting. And Geico's, you know, uh, Ajit has, you know, basically said that. And I think Buffett said that, that, you know, they've been better at pricing out every, you know, risk, matching the the, uh, risk uh, price and risk of each driver uh, better than Geico has. And I think it's a lot better than Geico has over time. And I think it's a lot better than most of the industry. Now, I don't know if that'll keep forever, but I think that that's a pretty strong thing to have. And uh, in an environment where I get worried about that, I might worry a little bit more about Geico than I would about Progressive, about the underwriting, um, uh, whether it's uh, whether they're fast enough to do that. Um, to make the adjustments that they need to make and everything with, you know, the amount of disruption we have now where, like I said, some people's premiums are probably going up 20% and stuff. Now, inflation will come down real fast and everything, and then it'll be a whole different story. And so you could quickly go from them reporting a bad number to reporting a really nice number or something, you know, it depends. It's that can move fast and those things. So we'll see. And they'll always try to do a little bit less than they otherwise would because they got to take the retention into account. So, you know, they know that if they raise it like 9%, a lot fewer people are going to cancel than if they raise it like 15. And so there's a temptation to do it, you know, that way and say, well, can we do that over two or three years and stuff and hold the people because there's a very high customer acquisition cost, right? Like everything Progressive does is based in taking into account and Geico too, I'm sure, but taking into account that your pricing is based also on how likely they are to retain you and everything. So you have to remember that if you're switching between one to the other, one to the other, you're less attractive to them and they actually will should price it differently. Um, so it's not purely your risk that way. They want to do a lifetime calculation on you overall. It's not just like how likely you are to get into accidents. So um, yeah, I, I think it's a good organization. And then the last question we got, and again, you can email your question to focuscompounding at gmail.com and I will pull some for the podcast every week. Somebody has said, I would love to get your thoughts on Southwest Airlines. Might this be an interesting time to consider the company given the turmoil they're going through? And that question um, uh, got me interested in just the commercial aviation industry in general. And I thought we could spend some time going over airlines today and then, you know, put some of them in quick FS, talk about Southwest, uh, talk about American Airlines United, basically spend some time going over uh, the airline industry where we currently sit today. Uh, but before we do that, a little bit history. Here's your primer, Jeff, on the uh, aviation industry. Uh, the first scheduled air service began in 1914. In the 1920s and 1930s, commercial air travel began to grow in popularity. Uh, with airlines such as Pan American Airways and TWA offering international flights. I looked up uh, what those airplanes looked like and count me out. They do not look anything like the airplanes that we fly on today. Uh, during World War II, many commercial aircrafts were used for military purposes. But after the war, the industry experienced a period of rapid expansion. Obviously, I would say you know air travel is probably one of the greatest inventions in mankind i'd put what else would you put up next to that um medicine certain medicines air conditioning uh but aviation uh to be able to travel and send mm -hmm. packages the fact that we could have a package in china within i don't know two days is just still mind-boggling to me um the 1950s and 1960s saw the introduction of jet airliners such as the boeing 707 and the douglas dc-8 
which significantly increased the speed and efficiency of air travel. Very interesting. And I believe this is what they looked like back in, you know, circa 1920 time frame. Very, very mm -hmm. different from today. Uh, I love this picture right here because I love the individual that's just smoking a cigarette on an airplane. Why, why is it that you can no longer smoke on airplanes? Is that like a safety thing or is that more so like a, you know, uh, smoke and no one no. likes to be around smoke? Kind of like restaurants. No, no, no. It, it, yeah, no, it's, it's like <laughs> restaurants. Yeah. Yeah, I figured. Uh, that lasted a lot longer than you think. Air smoking on when I was airplanes? For, when I, let's see. When I was first flying on planes as a kid. Well, Jeff, how old are you? Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> would they have still had a smoking section? No, I don't remember that. So they may, may, they may have already had no smoking at all then. If so, it was very recent. Very recent. Was it just cigarettes? Like, did they have any rules around it? Like, could you just smoke a cigar on an airplane? Well, I mean, they didn't have rules about it, so I guess so, yeah. Yeah. But remember, you smoked it everywhere. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, everywhere had that. Yeah. Obviously, they, they were smoking in restaurants when I was growing up. Yeah. Same here. I mean, obviously, yeah. So, um, but I mean, all restaurants, there was no things that didn't have it. So, I mean, you've been to casinos and stuff. That's what it was like all the time everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's like one of the best so. things about a casino. You just sit there, play blackjack, and smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> but no, imagine being on an airplane and somebody smoking a cigar next to you i mean i just know times are different and that's what everybody did but gosh that would uh that would have been uh smelly for sure uh yeah. unless you like smoking cigars of course then you know it's just it is what it is okay let's continue so the airline deregulation act of 1978 it deregulated the airline industry in the united states and allowed new airlines to enter the market and compete with the established major airlines. Uh, this deregulation, the thesis of it was for better pricing and more efficiency. Um, on some studies I saw, Jeff, it sounds like pricing came down like a little bit. I mean, not crazy amounts, uh, you know, 20% uh, is what a lot of studies were referencing. I couldn't really get one, you know, black and white figure on that. Um, but some yeah. notable airlines that started after deregulation, People Express, which started operations in 1981 and quickly grew to become one of the largest airlines in the United States before merging with Continental Airlines in 1987. Uh, Southwest Airlines, which started operations in 1971 and grew to become one of the largest and most profitable airlines in the United States. Obviously, that's the airline that prompted uh, this history primer. Uh, America West Airlines, which started operations in 1983 and later merged with U.S. Airways to form American Airlines Group. JetBlue Airways, which started operations in 2000, is now one of the largest airlines in the United States. Uh, Spirit Airlines. I didn't know that they go all the way back to 1980, uh, but that's when they started operations uh, and is now one of the largest ultra low cost airlines. What's their motto? Your ass and gas. That's all you're paying for um, in the United States. And of course, Spirit merged with JetBlue in 2022. We've spoken about that on the podcast. Um, I'm always so interested in just like the history of industries and just how there's so mm -hmm. many players involved. And you see that in technology and uh, businesses and industries, even today, it's just, it's a, a land share grab. Just go and grab as much market share as you possibly can. And then you enter the phase where either, you know, uh, capital dries up or there's, you know, no one, there's no, uh, food left for somebody to kill and then consolidation starts in the industry and i thought it was interesting mm -hmm. kind of learning about the airlines that we see today how many other airlines you know have made up the business uh that is at today um twa mm -hmm. right merged uh and is effectively american airlines today but you just look at all the big players and how many different airlines make that up yeah so Southwest is one of the only ones that only bought ones that were exactly like them. So Morris is what we, uh, I talked about where I said, I read a couple books on, I read blue streak flying high and nuts. But in particular, I mentioned to you that, uh, there's a couple podcasts that people might like on, um, what is it? How I built this. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the podcast? Yep. Yeah. Um, cause there's one with is, uh, the founder of, 
Southwest sort of founder of Southwest, um, and one that is the founder of JetBlue. And uh, so he sold Morris to Southwest because they were the same idea. He had copied Southwest's idea. Um, and and um, Airtran was uh, exactly like Southwest too. It had a uh, bad uh, accident. So that's why, it, I mean, like uh, eventually, you know, I don't know the, all the details of how it was, wh why it took a, so long between that time and when it was sold, but I don't think that it ever performed as well after uh, there was a um, uh, fatal incident that they were responsible for. So In the United States? Yeah. They packed, um, they, they mislabeled some stuff and they put oxygen stuff with uh, loaded oxygen stuff onto a plane next to tires and it was a bad fire. Oof. So um, it was the, one of the only ones where they, the responsibility for it was said that it was like the, how way that the airline handled things and mistakes that were made on the ground and stuff rather than some sort of mistake from the pilot or the plane, you know, which is usually what they attribute these things to and not something that had to do with what was loaded on and stuff. But I, I think there was some pretty long period between when that happened and when they actually bought them though, but they were pretty fast growing and stuff until then. So, mm. yeah. And, um, and then the others were much uglier, right? So they tried to combine a lot of different bit, airlines that had you know all sorts of different things to do with um uh like all sorts of different um business models and stuff right mm -hmm. so you can see the difference between like alaska and then the difference between you know united delta and american which are just made up of all sorts of different things and then virgin america mm -hmm. how different was their business and model yeah, and so the you know part of the two books about JetBlue go into talking about how originally they'd wanted to launch JetBlue as Virgin. The JetBlue was supposed to be Virgin America, but they couldn't. They didn't work it out together. JetBlue wanted to find someone, so they were like, "Can it be Virgin? Does someone want to like launch Coca Cola Air or something? You know, like we need a brand name to get launched." And uh, their their preferred one was Virgin. But they looked at different ones and they just figured that no one was going to do a brand name with them because of the risks, you know, of if something happened. So, um, so yeah, so the, they ended up just going with JetBlue, which wasn't a favorite name that they had. But, they, but, it, was, but it was originally JetBlue was originally going to be Virgin America. That's what it was planned to be. Got it. So uh, Warren Buffett has dabbled in uh, the airline industry. And I found this uh, document that goes over just his investments in the airline industry throughout his career. And the first one was in uh, US Air. And some parts of this document are sourced from his actual writings, his annual letters. And I thought it was interesting just because he just talks about what happened when deregulation came to the industry. Um, it says, in making the US Air purchase, your chairman displayed exquisite timing i plunge into the business at almost the exact moment that it ran into severe problems i thought that was very funny um he said industry-wide problems have proved to be far more serious since our purchase the economics of the airline industry have deteriorated at an alarming pace accelerated by the kamikaze pricing tactics of certain carriers the trouble this pricing has produced for all carriers illustrates an important truth and this was my uh favorite part in a business selling a commodity type product, it's impossible to be a lot smarter than your dumbest competitor. So he ultimately, I think, didn't lose a ton of money on this investment. Um, but you know, from there on out, he had always spoken about how tough it is to invest in airlines and, and you know why he believes it's a, a hard industry for investors. Uh, and then 2020 comes around. And we spoke about this on the podcast and uh, news came out that they bought roughly 10% of the four largest airlines. Um, and it was more of like a industry play, but I'm generally, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, why do you think Buffett's always been attracted to airlines? Why is it so tough? I mean, is it really a pricing thing? And if there's anything we can take away from it, some sort of potential red flags or a bunch of red flags maybe uh that we could you know use as we look at other companies to become you know better investors and avoid certain pitfalls 
Well, I mean, the U.S. Air one was preferred stock. Yeah. And so that's the problem. Uh, now, I don't even know they lost anything on it because weren't they able to sell it? Um, so, I mean, I know they marked it down severely, but, you know, the the yeah. industry did recover a bit, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Um, yeah. The thing is, right, that as you just talked about, there was regulation, right? So like, for instance, Southwest copying something that was done in California had the exact same strategy, which was to operate just in Texas. And th because they wouldn't be regulated, because in the United States, you're not going to be regulated. If you operate only within one state, you won't be operate. You're not going to be, uh, th there's not going to be the same rules as a federal regulation of it. So you can avoid all of that by being in one state, right? Same thing as banking things before that all got deregulated too. You know, banking basically got deregulated in the sense that many, many states did not allow banks from out of the state to buy into the state and to merge with each other. So you you were basically limited to one state and a bunch of states. Um, and then when deregulation happened, then of course you had really rapid um, growth and then a bunch of consolidation and all of that. But, you know, that's like a lot of industries like this that that happens. So it's an unusual situation that you had all these things that already existed and then the deregulation, but like telecom stuff and things in the US did the same thing. So it does happen. Um, so, I mean, I read a book about bus deregulation in the UK and it's, it has a lot of similarities to this too. What's that? Be well, that they went to allowing, you know, bus companies to basically mm -hmm. oh, bus. Know, local bus routes to be, yeah. Yeah, and the economics are awfully similar too, you know. Um, of all of these, which is tough if you are, were regulated and then, you know, it's going to be a price war and stuff until those that survive. Um, so I think that's a, and then like, then it's got this famous reputation now as an industry of being such a terrible business and everything. Yeah. He said when From deregulation that, yeah. came along, it did not immediately change the picture. The capacity of low cost carriers yes. was so small that the high cost lines could in large part maintain their existing fare structures during this period with the longer term problems largely invisible but slowly metastasizing the costs that were not sustainable became further embedded yeah and that's it took a that's the thing it took a very very long time so like southwest um for example was in each uh in each airport that I was going to was you know um taking a lot of share but it was moving so slowly across the country. I mean, it moved very slowly compared to the other ones that we mentioned. Like they were much more aggressive, like JetBlue and all that. They wanted to be everywhere pretty fast um, as compared to Southwest that was very, very conservative in picking out what places to go. Although very aggressive in terms of once they went there, they were gonna take over uh, a lot of share in that airport. So they kind of um, did that. And that meant that some didn't notice for a long time what the problem was, which is that they had much lower costs. You know, these other airlines that have been started up, some of them. And actually, there was a lot of them that were started up that had lower costs. I mean, I flew on a bunch of different airlines that don't exist today. I don't know how many, but I would guess, what do you think, like maybe 60 airlines were probably started and failed in the United States between the end of deregulation and, say, around the late 1990s. Since then, there's been not a lot of entry. I mean, there's the things we can mention, like the ones you've heard of and stuff. But the really aggressive period is probably for, I don't know, 15 to 20 years after, probably like 15 years or something after 1978. That's the ones where they all start. Did you ever fly on uh, Trump Airlines? No. <laughs> mm -mm. Uh, now, it also kind of overstates how many airlines there are, of course, because with all of these, you know, they uh, only a few airlines account for most of the traffic out of many airports, you know, in terms of most of the gates and things. So like when I said I've flown on air airlines that didn't exist, people in other parts of the country would have never heard of that airline. I didn't know what a Southwest was, you know, being in the Northeast because mm -hmm. they, they didn't come over to New York and stuff. Um, and likewise, people wouldn't have known about things like that I flew from um from New York to Florida, right? Um, which is the same route that JetBlue would do later too. So, um, yeah. So, you know, it's look. They look very attractive, right? Mm -hmm. they, you know, if you want something that's a ten billion dollars or up, the things that look most attractive, if you didn't know what industry it's in and stuff, is of course things like Southwest. 
um, the free cash flow they're generating a few years ago and that people are expecting them to be generating the next few years is a high percentage of what they uh, of what of their market cap. They don't really there there's some dilution possibilities outstanding, but they don't really have debt to be honest. Because if you think about the cash and stuff, they have it kind of offsets that, and then and then what they own. So um, if you you know, so I would say that the that they're you know overcapitalized for an airline certainly um, at this point. But I don't think that they. So I think that what free cash flow is generating in the future will be used for. Probably buybacks eventually. They never paid much of a dividend, but it could be a long time before they buy back because they obviously had this terrible, um, terrible job. Uh, that's a lot of bad publicity and stuff for them. Recently. That they canceled. Yeah. So for the last 10 days mm-hmm. of the year, last year, they canceled about two thirds of their flights. So it's 17,000 flights. And um, that. They say they're going to pay th- about three hundred dollars on average to over two million passengers. That's crazy. And they're also paying they're also paying flight attendants and pilots like uh, giving them extra uh, payments just to because of having to do put up with what happened. Um, so I think they said they're like actually by the time this podcast comes out, they may have reported like they're going to report and you know this week I think. Um, but it's like it could be 800, 850 million, something like that. I think they said. Um, that's of course uh, same thing, same sort of thing is why uh, with JetBlue, their founder was thrown out of the company. So he was thrown out because of the same thing, you know, winter uh, uh, issues. And what was it? I forget. That one might have been near Valentine's Day or something instead of Christmas, but something like that. And uh, yeah, so they they kicked him out because you know JetBlue had problems and got um, bad publicity from it and they used that opportunity to throw him out of the company. Is this like a American Express one-time issue salad oil scandal or what would your thoughts be if you're looking at Southwest in, today? In the long run, I don't think that it affects um, people's using airlines. There, I mean, it's pretty limited like what your choices are. I mean... If we pick something, you know, in the United States where um, it, without changing which airport you go to and stuff, you're going to have a big limitations, right? So say take Dallas or something. You'd have to go Dallas-Fort Worth. This is the division between the two because they have a historical issue between them. But Southwest does love, and there's a few other airlines in there, but not in the major airlines. And then the major airlines that aren't Southwest are in Dallas Fort Worth. And uh, that's because the government wanted to build the Dallas Fort Worth airport and ha- have all the airlines leave and Southwest didn't want to leave. So they fought it and they were allowed to uh, keep love open. They were going to get rid of it. Um, so, um, th- and the same thing, you know, so take New York. So like if you flew from Dallas to New York or something, you got three airports in New York, your choices are limited, right? Because you can't fly to some with some of the um, airlines. So that was the issue that JetBlue had to convince people of is that generally they flew to, to airports that were not as popular. So they flew domestically at JFK, which was basically just an international airport at the time. And um, a lot of people didn't want to go to JFK. They wanted to go to Newark. And um, so that's the difference that you, that, that's the issue that you face there. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of choices and stuff, so I don't expect a lot of people to be affected. It didn't seem to have a huge long-term effect on JetBlue. I don't think it'll have a long-term effect much on Southwest. I mean, they compete on what it, what kind of routes they have out of the airport you want to go from, what the price is, and the frequent flyer program. So Southwest doesn't have much of a frequent flyer program compared to the other ones. But um, Do you think customers yeah. are pretty uh, loyal to Southwest? Like Jeff Gannon, if he's flying, I know nine times out of 10, he's flying Southwest. Me, nine times out of 10, unless really I'm flying with you, it's American yeah. Airlines, right? And See, I have, like, so I have the go. American Airlines loyalty card, uh, credit card. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious, like, what do you think it is about customers and flying on certain airlines? Because um, I know people that only fly United Airlines, for example. I think, I think 
Well, there's a couple things. One, you have business travel, so they don't care if they're wasting their company's money. <laughs> yeah. And then you have um uh and then you have uh the idea that they'll match, right? So it's the same thing as with the insurance things and stuff. Is there loyalty? There might be loyalty to a point, but like I just said, the two issues are you won't be loyal if they if you if you go to an airport that they're no longer near. So if you move to a different part of the country and American was not in that airport. Uh, I think you might fly a different airline. And so obviously there's large parts of the country where that's true. Um, you could pick a different airport in a lot of places, but it, you, a lot of people aren't going to drive an extra hour or something to do that. Um, and then I think that the, you're basically assuming that they're going to match prices pretty closely, right? So you can see that. You can look that up in some cases. Um, now, officially, I guess Southwest wouldn't be – if you search for it, you wouldn't see Southwest – because they have their own system probably. But you, obviously you can compare them and stuff. It's not a problem. And you can see whether the price is close on something. Sometimes the price is lower on one than on others, obviously, um, for certain routes. And um, I think that generally people are assuming that the price will be pretty close and then they just go with the same airline all the time. Sure. Do you think airlines have pricing power, right? Because to some point it's like, well, if you got to fly on a plane and you need to get somewhere, you're going to pay for it. Do you think there's like the perfect amount of competition that keeps prices from being, you know, multiples of where they currently are at. How do you think about that? No, I mean, I think if the United States built a lot more airports and had a whole different system and didn't have what it originally had, a lot more people would fly and the flights would be a lot cheaper. I mean, the whole idea of Southwest and JetBlue certainly is that they would have to increase the, when they went into airports, they had to increase the number of people who would fly between the, the, the routes that they were doing. So by lowering the prices, they would get more uh, passengers overall. And so they, it wasn't by t just taking market share from someone else. They never assumed that that was all that they were going to be able to do. So yeah, I think that if the situation was different, you could have lower prices and then you would have more people flying. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, now, <sighs> since September 11th, there are added issues about how long it takes um, to get through airports and things like that. And that also cuts down on it. I mean, Southwest's business made more sense before then. It was very easy to fly domestically and get through airports very, very easily. Uh, international is the same as what it is now, basically. But, you know, domestic was very different. And so their idea of having a company that was more like a, you know, Greyhound bus um, for the country that was just in the air made a lot more sense then, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, I think if they could get prices down, but I think the issue why you can't get prices down basically is uh, airports and stuff like that, not really the airlines themselves. You're just not going to be able to turn the planes and stuff. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's an issue of anything else. Would you rather own the airport or the airline? Um, well, I mean, it depends on the price, but probably the, the airline. Why is that? Well, I mean, the airline's more flexible, so... I don't know how I would like owning something that's tied to one's particular position and all the political things that are in that and stuff. I mean, like I said, they tried to get rid of Love to replace it with Dallas Fort Worth, and Love is a big airport now and stuff. So <laughs> there's always going to be political things of Mexico or Australia or whatever that I don't understand. So um, yeah, I mean, the airline, it's easy for them to move from one thing to another pretty much. So I would probably feel more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But at the right place, I'm sure that I would buy an airport, sure. Mm -hmm. So Southwest Airlines, would you be interested in where we currently are Right now, that was the original question. I mean, yeah, if you're ever going to buy an airline, then I guess you would buy this, right? I mean, it's hard to come up with arguments for not buying it. Um, but the argument is you just don't buy airlines, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think the COVID thing probably concerns some people, right? So that they all had to take bailouts. Um, and that the idea that they would be, you know, that that would be forced on them basically in the future, you know, that the, that they would be expected to keep flying and stuff. And that if that meant that the stock would go to zero or something, then that's what would be done, you know? So it is sort of a thing that, you know, it's a politically sensitive, it's a government thing, the same way that in some countries media things are, whatever things are, that it's going to have involvement, even in places that are deregulated in emergency situations like that. Uh, it's going to be um, not completely treated like a private thing. So... Would you ever be interested in owning an airline, though? They're too big for us. Let's say so, you could purchase larger companies. If I had to buy companies that are over ten billion, I probably would end up having to buy airlines sometimes. Wow. Well, There's not what is twenty billion dollars in market cap and as attractive as this, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, until COVID, the company made money basically forty 
years in a row. Um, the returns on capital are all over the place, but obviously perform pretty well as a business generally. Um, expectations for free cash flow going forward are good. The, the like I said, the um, I mean, I have no idea when they'll actually be able to start buying back stock because obviously they have terrible press from this yeah. and um, but they can't buy other things. These big airlines aren't gonna be able to buy other things and Southwest is not a international airline. So it's not gonna be able to buy anything and it ha doesn't have a history of paying a dividend. So, you know, uh, I looked at how many, like what Boeing, what they said were like firm orders and stuff and said, okay, let's assume that everything that they did they get from Boeing in terms of planes and they pay for all, you know, uh, on that basis. And then let's assume that as debt matures, they don't actually roll anything over. They just, you know, pay it all off mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I still get to the issue that, um, like it's 2023 right now, by 2025 or so, they wouldn't be able to absorb their cash flows. So if you're going to have normal cash flows of the level that you did before, um, happening here, then you're going to have to start buying back five or ten percent, you know, of the company a year within just a couple of years. So, Azul ticker A Z U L. Would you ever buy a uh, international airline? Uh, they provide passenger and cargo transportation services in Brazil. The company operated 850 daily departures to 125 destinations through a network of 259 nonstop routes with a fleet of 179 aircrafts. Yeah, so like this is the one that was started by the uh, guy who did JetBlue um, and also Morris here, like we mentioned before. Um, so he, if you listen to the podcast and stuff that I was talking about, um, his background was that he was actually, I believe, born in Brazil, but he um, went there as a missionary, as a Mormon and stuff. So that's probably why that was the place that he decided to do another airline when it was outside the United States. Um, he actually had done one in Canada too. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know enough about Brazil and stuff to be able to make a decision in it the same way. Um, uh, but I, you know, I read their, their earnings call, um, transcript and presentation and stuff. And obviously it's a possibility that it's more interesting because they fly to a lot more places that really other, airlines don't fly to, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more opportunity maybe over time to, like we were talking about, if, if you have lower prices and get bring more people in and connect more places that weren't connected before, it's a lot more like when Southwest was starting out in the, uh, when, when deregulation started, but actually just, you know, um, to being able to fly between places that weren't getting a lot of um, flights before. That's not going to happen in the United States, right? So if people are interested in that kind of company, then that's more, you know, what you'd see here as opposed to these other ones, which are not growth companies at all. They're just, you know, they're, they're very mature in the U S got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I in the focus compounding podcast. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, be sure to follow me on Twitter at, at focus compound, uh, subscribe to our YouTube and, uh, leave us a rating review on the podcast side of things. That still goes a very long way for us almost five years into it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about our money management services, reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. Would love to start that conversation. I thank everybody so much for all the support. We'll see you in the next podcast. Take care.